Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Why should we let little things like business, education, transportation, family, life get in the way of our politics? <laughs> that may seem a bit flippant, but the point is, how have we found ourselves defending social positions or personal preferences that may be indefensible? Welcome again to the most widely watched source and the longest running dialogue on Carolina business and public policy. I am Chris William and we will wade into these issues of the day and how they compare and contrast to what is important with our panel in just a moment. And later, a leader with a long history at Palmetto State politics, education and health care, to name just a handful, Fred Carter from Francis Marion University. Major funding also by Novant Health bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, John Hood of the John William Pope Foundation, Jamie Moon from the Institute for Child Success, and special guest, Dr. Fred Carter, president of Francis Marion University. Hello, welcome to our program. Happy spring. Uh, John, good to have you back. And uh, Jamie, nice to meet you. Glad Very to, nice to glad meet to you. Here. You might feel differently at the end of this program, but at least for <laughs> now, we're glad to have you. So, John, as we were talking before the program, House Bill 2 in North Carolina is polarizing, to say the least. Mm -hmm. But, I, but and, and South Carolina is, is, is not exempt from this kind of political debate, at least current political debate. I, I, John, I think uh, LBGT rights, the bathroom bill, whatever we call this, it seems like that politics have become even more acute in rhetoric. How have we found ourselves in this position? I think there are many factors that lead us to be uh, sort of challenged to have a conversation when it comes to controversial issues like this one that came up in North Carolina. Part of it has to do with the media environment that people live in today. They tend to live in cocoons created through social media so that they more or less seek out people or institutions or even media sources that reinforce what they think. So they'll put a post on their Facebook page or tweet something and most of their friends agree with them and it just all reinforces the same views on either side. But I also think this is a fundamental failure of imagination. In order to have a meaningful conversation about a tough issue, you have to imagine that someone else could come to a different conclusion from you, even though they're in good faith and they maybe even possess the same set of facts, but they reason to a different conclusion. In the particular case of uh, the Charlotte ordinance, the anti-discrimination ordinance that led to the legislative reaction mm -hmm. in Raleigh, the Charlotte folks had a year to get it right and didn't get it right. Uh, there was a constant, uh, uh, constantly stated concern that if you had gender identity as one of the protected classes in an anti-discrimination ordinance and you applied that to bathrooms, showers, locker rooms, that that might allow people who are not really transgendered people, but people who are pretending to be saying for the day, oh, I'm a, I feel like a woman today, to be able to go into the bathroom and intrude on the privacy mm -hmm. of others. So that was a frequently stated argument for months. The people who proposed the ordinance in Charlotte apparently didn't really take that seriously, that that was a sincere concern. So when you get to the legislature, that's what they're talking about. We need to protect women and children's privacy. Women, keep men out of women's uh, showers, okay. Now, the problem there is, did they fully appreciate the problems that transgendered people have? So, 
One could argue the solution that the North Carolina legislature came up with, and there are a lot of different provisions, some of which don't have to do with the bathroom. And I do think there's room for conversation and for moving forward on some solutions. But the fundamental problem stemmed from an inability to imagine that the other person's point of view was valid. Because you've got to do that in order to work it out. So I want to I want to come back to a couple of things before I do that. Jamie, so South Carolina is not exempt from these kind of debates. In fact, That's Governor right. Haley has said recently, LGBT bathroom bills uh, won't happen in South Carolina. We're, we don't have that issue here. South Carolina has had other issues. One is the anti-refugee bill that is, is punitive to churches if one of the refugees does something that could be harmful. I, I don't want to I don't want to tweeze that out, Jamie, but it, 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 the same question. Do we have a much higher degree of acrimony among our, our, our difference in politics now in this year than we ever have? It would seem so, and I agree with John for regarding most of the reasons. I think a lot of it has to do with the media and what we are, are seeing play out on television. And whereas these issues are important to some individuals, and I very much appreciate that, I think what they're doing is they're distracting us from some of the larger issues that we've been wrestling with for years. In South Carolina, for instance, we have infrastructure issues, but we also have human infrastructure challenges. Um, on the last report of the Annie Casey um, Foundation's Kids Count, mm -hmm. South Carolina ranked near the bottom of states in terms of early childhood um, well-being and safety and education. And these are the types of issues that I think are important that we need to be focused on and when we get these um, highly charged issues come up and we have them come up, what I think happens is that they tend to, if you will, suck the air out of the room and there's little left, little time left to debate some of these other issues, which I think are extraordinarily important. Is there, is there a, a, you know, to both of you, is there, is there a, a priority or a pecking order to say that, and this is not going to completely say it, John, but I think you know what I'm, where I'm going with this, that social issues shouldn't be as important as educational policy or transportation policy, but, I mean, is there a way to prioritize how we debate and not let social differences just take over the day? Well, I think that for the most part, if you ask people in polls, and I've seen polls in both Carolinas that ask people what are the top issues, and you're probably not going to find social issues at the top for most voters. It usually is the economy, education, a variety of other large-scale public policy questions. But for some people, it is the top, and they're going to be vocal. And it seems to me that the solution is to focus as much as possible on resolving conflicts to the extent you can and recognizing that in a free society, people are going to inevitably have differences of opinion on deeply personal matters. And our, I think our default solution should be Whatever you want to do with your property, with your body, mm -hmm. is your business. Don't intrude on mine. And otherwise, let's talk about taxes. Let's talk about education. Let's talk about health care. Uh, I think that's not an adequate solution, but it's the only solution I've come up with right now. So, Jamie, getting back to South Carolina, and I, and I, I don't want to go down this road and bring this all back up, but is the only way we learn how to change and be accepting is what happens in Charleston when there's a tragedy at the Mother Emanuel Church, or there, which, which ends up finally bringing down that Confederate flag that flew above the State House. I mean, is that how we learn? Is that the only way we learn? I, I hope not. It would seem to be, recent, in recent years, it seems like that has been the pattern. But what I hope we can get to as a society in both Carolinas and indeed across the nation is one that definitely <coughs> appreciates opposing viewpoints, that seeks to understand in a meaningful way the nuances of the other person's argument, whatever that argument might be, that, um, that seeks to respect them from a, um, from a human standpoint and also appreciate that as passionately as they may feel about a particular issue, the other person feels equally, maybe in a completely opposite way. I think hopefully we can, we can start to infuse that sort of civility back into the um, public dialogue related to some of these issues, whether they be social issues or whether they be what I consider to be the more pressing issues, things such as infrastructure, mm -hmm. education, health, that type of thing. So, so uh, quickly, John, in about a minute, so do, do things like the governor in, in North Carolina, Governor McCrory's 
proposal about increasing teacher pay, the mm -hmm. fact that North Carolina has had tax cuts and, oh yeah, by the way, a surplus mm -hmm. in their budget. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, that over two thirds of the voters in North Carolina supported a $2 billion bonds bill. Do, does that kind of stuff get lost in the wake of, uh, of, of sometimes the silliness of social debate? Well, quite literally, when the governor made his announcement in uh, near Greensboro in North Carolina about his teacher pay proposal, his larger budget proposals for education, in many newspapers the following day, that was page two or page three news. Mm -hmm. And the front page story was about uh, the bathrooms and discrimination ordinances. So uh, obviously it has that effect, but these are big issues and they're gonna get their due. I mean, North Carolina and South Carolina have gone through tremendous change in the last several years, economically and politically, and we're gonna keep talking about those things. But right now, the most exciting news, the thing that makes the front page, makes the front of the newscast, is, is not, uh, not teacher pay increases. Yeah. You know, it, it, I'm, I'm afraid to say the thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history, and that seems to repeat <laughs> itself. Uh, gentlemen, stay with us. We're gonna bring our guest on in just a moment. Next week on this program, he is at, at the point of the spear for a billion dollar makeover of one of the oldest, in fact, the oldest and the largest research triangle park in this country. It is RTP in North Carolina. Bob Giolis, the CEO of RTP, will be here. Uh, in a, and then coming up in a couple weeks, Terry Aiken, the CEO of Cone Health, will be here. And Mike Reardon, the ch chief executive officer of Greenville Health from upstate South Carolina, will also be here. Francis Marion University is located pretty close to dead center in South Carolina, the state's PD region, in fact. It is one of the state's uh, baker's dozen of public co-ed universities. Its swamp fox in chief is someone with a deep and broad practical experience in political science, health care, and of course, education. He is also a philosopher and a published author. We welcome Francis Marion University President, Dr. Fred Carter. Dr. Carter, welcome. And have you been called a philosopher of late? You know, not of late. A few, <laughs> few, few university presidents are viewed as philosophers <laughs> these days, okay? But thanks, Chris, for the accolade. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Fred, you have, you know, you've heard the dialogue on the first part of this program. You were in the Sanford administration. You were in the Campbell administration in South Carolina. You were a poli-sci professor at the College of Charleston. You have been deep in politics for a long time in the Palmetto State. What do you think about some of the current rhetoric? You know, some of it has, I think, to do with the fact that the General Assemblies are trifurcated now instead of bifurcated. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's little question that the, the evolution or devolution of the Republican Party, however you want to view it, has created essentially two tiers of Republicans. And, and frankly, the coalition shift depending upon what issues are in front of the General Assembly. Of course, in South Carolina, there's, a, there's another influence on this too, and it's the shifting population base. With the influx of new populations along the coast or in the upstate, as Jamie well knows, that tend to be much more conservative than areas like the PD or the Savannah River Valley. Mm -hmm. we're, we're decade to decade changing the ideological base of the state as well. Not just with politics, but also with social norms. So does this mean that South Carolina could move even more right? What? I think it's I think it's possible for almost any state to move even more right. Um, absolutely. Yeah. We, I know we could spend a lot of time on this. So uh, let's talk about Francis Marion University. Sure. Let's talk about uh, education. Um, one of your big stakes in the ground, um, and there are there are many, Dr. Carter, but one is f fill in this worker skills gap. Uh, how critical is this really? Have we reached a tipping point? And what's the solution for making sure that we get those workers in the right places? You know, a big part of it, I think, are educational institutions at all levels, K through 12, as well as, as higher education, being more attentive, essentially, to marketplace needs. You know, we, Francis Marion's a good example. We spent the first 30 years of our history being a, a you know, a, a quintessential liberal arts institution. And then about 13 years ago, we started moving in the direction of health sciences, engineering, uh, the types of majors that would allow us to essentially put our graduates into areas that would have an immediate effect on the market of our region. Now, let me make the point very clear to, to you gentlemen and to my faculty back home <laughs> that we still rely upon a very, very strong liberal arts foundation for the education. 
of those nurse practitioners and physician assistants and, and engineers. But in truth, we have more of an eye on what those kids are going to do after they graduate and what impact that has on the economy, rather than simply looking at education in the abstract. Mm -hmm. John. So speaking of the economy, both Carolinas are, have rapidly growing economies, at least according, compared to the national average. I don't know that anybody's happy about the speed of recovery from the Great Recession, but, right. uh, but that rapid growth is not equally distributed across the entire uh, state in either case. You've got regions that are growing rapidly, maybe even outstripping to some extent their infrastructure and their ability to keep up. Other regions that are not growing at all or even depopulating. What role do public institutions of higher education have in addressing these gaps, these disparities in growth? You know, I remember, you know, John, your, your comments bring back the, the, the John Edwards theme from I a apologize few presidential, for that. <laughs> from a few yeah. years back, the two economies, okay? <laughs> and, and it's not exclusively urban and rural. Right. It's essentially those neglected part of the states, as, uh, or of a state, as opposed to the more thriving developmental parts. But it really has created a division in states relative to economic success or economic stagnation. And I think we feel that in very, very strong ways in South Carolina. I had mentioned the Savannah River Valley and the PD as being areas that continue to lag behind with regard to, to job creation, with regard to median income. Frankly, with regard to health indicators, which is even more troubling. But obviously, those higher education institutions, especially those located in the more distressed areas of the state, seems to me that they have a unique obligation to try essentially to bridge that gap. Mm. Now, let me make a point clear. Some of that's dependent upon the funding those institutions are provided, okay? Mm -hmm. Jimmy? You know, the Institute for Child Success, we're very interested and concerned about early childhood. And one of the centers of excellence in our state is at Francis Marion University, the Gail and Terry Richardson Center for the Child. And I wondered if you could just elaborate a little bit more about how you see that center playing a larger part in the university's success. Sure, as you know, that's a unique center. We, we got into the early childhood education business with a, a child development center and research center about the time that many universities were getting out of that business because of liability issues, because of the cost of accommodating uh, children and, and child development centers. But given where we're located, Given the, the impoverished nature of many of the school districts around us, it was fundamentally important for us to move in that direction. We developed a center, I believe now that center, Jamie, you might know this better, I believe that center now is about a decade old, That's uh, right. uh, nine or 10 years old. We received a fair amount of private funding and state funding, and we developed a state-of-the-art child development center right alongside an early childhood education Child Psychology Research Center, so that we can we can um, integrate essentially the research purposes, the the therapeutic purposes along with child development care, and of course one of the things I'm most proud about that center is not simply the fact that we're we're world class child development um, best practices, but that we're able to bring uh, children from throughout the school districts around us in for therapeutic evaluations and courses of study that are unique to that student and we never charge school districts or parents for that kind of work. So it, it provides a wonderful uh, benefit I think for those I guess now we serve about 21 school districts right around the university. So Dr. Carter take this just a little bit farther. So there's a lot of chatter in both Carolinas about policy around third grade reading scores. Right. And if we can up these then the kids uh, options for success are, are a lot better. So as we talk about this, and this has been a start, a stop again initiative over the years, is this, is this a bona fide start? Is this going to catch some fire? Our legislators, the state house is in, is in session, North Carolina is going to be in session. So will they be able to fund this type of early childhood and primary education adequately, you think? Permit me to put my old governor's chief of hat back on for a second. <laughs> yes, they should, okay? Now, are we gonna expand Medicaid? 
Are we going to fix those roads? Are we going to achieve in, in South Carolina education equity between the poor and more affluent districts? Mm -hmm. You know, all those are things that have to be sorted out in the funding equation as you move down to, you know, uh, three uh, th uh, third grade reading scores. Now, by the way, let me make this other point. My faculty would remind me that improving reading scores begins at six months old. It doesn't, it doesn't begin when a kid starts to school. It begins essentially at uh, very, very early on in that process. Of course, you know that, up the, that ups the ante considerably relative to the expense associated with that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John. Well, uh, speaking of expense, one of the big issues you see in the presidential campaign and in lots of other political conversation is college cost right. and student debt loads and the escalating challenges that these are presented. And some of the discussion seems to be about who's going to shoulder the cost. Should it be taxpayers more? Should it be parents and, and children? Should it be some, some private donors or whatever? But some of it is about actual cost, the actual cost of delivering education rising, regardless of who's paying for it. Are there some creative solutions, technology or organizational solutions to moderate the cost of delivering the service of higher education in the future? There have to be. The truth of the matter is tuition costs at colleges and universities are, are rising too rapidly for most families to be able to accommodate. It's also we're stacking student debt to the level that these men and women who are graduating are being saddled with an enormous responsibility at a point at which they're just trying to begin their life. I think a big part of it has to do with private fundraising. I think a big part of it has to do with different instructional approaches that aren't nearly as expensive as the traditional instructional approaches that we've had in years past. Probably some of it has to do with rethinking the way that we integrate young men and women into the workforce at the end of that four or five or six years of instruction. Uh, it seems to me that for, for many institutions faced with this, developing more internship programs, uh, um, co-op programs that allow those, uh, those students to work in the industries of their choice even before they graduate allow the opportunity to find other ways to, to deal with that, uh, that debt burden when they get out. Mm. Yeah. Jim? Yeah, I know that um, the University School of Nursing has received a lot of positive press. Um, can you speak a little bit more about what, what's happening with the School of Nursing, the graduate program in particular? I can. I'll be, in fact, thank you for asking the question, <laughs> Jamie. We've got, uh, we began about uh, maybe 12 years ago moving heavily into the health sciences. We developed uh, um, our first uh, Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree, Nurse Practitioner degree, Physician Assistant degree, will develop within the next two years uh, a Speech Pathology degree. And we've just completed in downtown Florence a uh, Health Sciences facility that will, interestingly enough, integrate and blend instruction across the spectrum from Nurse Practitioner to Physician Assistants to Clinical Psychologist to mm -hmm. medical students from the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. They'll all be studying in a common facility and they'll all have instruction that will require blended cooperation from area to area. The point being this, the economics of regions like the PD mean that you can no longer in small communities have two MDs practicing together. Medicaid reimbursement is not such that it makes it economically feasible. But you can't have a nurse practitioner and a physician practicing together mm -hmm. in which they trade off the on-call and you manage the prices at the level, quite honestly, that health care becomes at least marginally more affordable again. Do, do you see, we've got literally 30 seconds left, do you see a South Carolina, a governor, a, a, a state house that will ever accept those Medicaid dollars? Yes. In I the do. near term? In my lifetime, maybe not in my term, okay? okay. Right. I believe it will, and, and let me say this, Chris, very quickly. I think the needs of the state at some point are simply going to demand. Yeah, I, driven by economics. That's right. Oh, uh, I uh, Dr. Carter, thank you for being on the program. It's taken us a while, but we're so glad we got you here. Congratulations for everything you've done down there. 
It's good to have you here. Jamie, welcome. Good to have you here. John, always nice to have you on the program. Thank you, Thank you for watching. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.